So thank you very much for the gracious invitation to be here today. And thank you everybody for your interest. Um, I hope that I'll be able to bring something to you that's of interest to you. Um, if you uh, do not want, wish to be recorded on video, then uh, you should turn off your video right now. And um, here we go, because it is being recorded now. So I'm going to talk about parents with a migration background. And I'm asking the question then also, what does it take to raise bilingual children if you're a parent with a migration background? Now here, I have to, of course, define a little bit what, I'm, what do I mean with that? Because it's a very um, a diffuse term, having a migration background. So um, I'm here just referring to a person who used to live in another country or a very different region of the same country and who moved away from there. And it's irrelevant for my definition here, whether that's by choice or not. Um, so let's say what is at focus though, it's the persons themselves who have moved rather than previous generations of family members. So I'm not gonna talk about first generation, second. Well, these are first generation. Uh, migrant people. Um, and their intent is to either stay in the new region or their intent is to return home where they used to live or it's undecided. That is not of um, relevance here. So I give a few examples. Um, for instance, if you're a refugee to Syria, from Syria and you uh, got taken in by Germany, then I would say you're a person with a migration background. Right now, I'm just focusing on migration background, not on the parent part. That comes in a little bit. For instance, you've moved from Siberia to Moscow for work reasons, or from Poland to the United States for graduate study, or from Nigeria to Italy to escape poverty. So also, I'm talking about people from very different socioeconomic status. So I'm going to gloss over socioeconomic status. Of course, that's what that means too. Now, how about parents? What do I mean by parents? Those are caregivers of dependent children who live in a private household uh, and caregivers. Uh, they could be mothers of those children and or fathers, or they could not be actually related. Um, they could be single parents or they could be doing the co-parenting, taking care together, maybe with two, three, four parents in a family. That's all possible. In principle, um, I'm talking about parents, well, they'll have uh, any age beyond puberty. Uh, and also in principle, I'm talking about parents of children of any age, but Today, I'll focus on parents with cohabiting children between zero and 15 years of age, so not with adult children. Okay, so that sets the scene. Now, obviously, emigrating, as you all realize and know, often involves a change in linguistic soundscape. So in uh, what uh, people are hearing, and that's a term that I introduced in my 2009 book on bilingual first language acquisition. And of course, it's also a change in linguistic landscape, which refers more to what people visually see uh, around them in writing and so forth. Um, so what does it involve? It usually involves leaving behind a language or several languages of origin in the public sphere. So the public sphere changes and often the language changes too. You leave it behind, it's not the same. And you start using then as a person who has just migrated a language of origin only in the intimate sphere of the family. It's not out there in society, in the new society. Also, of course, you could not be using a language of origin anymore at all. And this is a, uh, a continuum. Uh, you could just use less and less of the language of origin or, or only the language of origin. But simultaneously, what's going to happen is there is either the learning a new societal language 
suck L here um, from scratch. So you're going to learn the language that is used in the public sphere of the place where you're moving to, or you already know that societal language a little bit and you're going to improve your proficiency in it, or you could not be engaging with the new societal language at all by choice or not by choice, you know, just because there's just no opportunity or you choose not to. So that again is quite a, um, a continuum there. So that's already a lot of variation language wise between um, parents with a migration background. Now, in addition, you know, this variability um, is, is made even wider because of very different linguistic profiles that parents may have. So they could have a high oral and literacy proficiency in the language of origin or not. They could have a high, and also they could have like a high oral proficiency, but a low literacy proficiency. So that's all possible as well. Um, and so you, they could have a high oral or literacy proficiency in the societal language or not. So that's a lot of variation right there. And when you look then at co-parents, so people who share the same household and have children to take care of, they could have similar linguistic proficiency profiles or not. They could individually differ quite a lot. So there's a huge range of variation here. You could also have, even though you've moved away, well, you from your language of origin, basically, from the public sphere, you could go to a new place and not have much of an interest in your language of origin anymore and just focus on your societal, on that new societal language. But then there are other people who have exactly the opposite profile. So there could be a great interest in language of origin or not or a great interest in the societal language or not. So you need to think about that. And in addition, if you are together with another parent in your family, in your household, then co-parents could have similar linguistic preference profiles or not. So there's a huge range of a possibility also for friction there or for more harmony, uh, but there's a huge range of variation. Um, in addition, different parents have different personal experiences with bilingualism as such, so with the very fact of knowing or learning uh, two languages. They also have different attitudes towards their languages. They will have different expectations as regards their children's language development and possible bilingualism with some parents not caring at all, others caring a lot. Some parents having high expectations, others not. We're not even thinking about it. They also differ widely in levels of education and in access to educational resources and information. I really want to stress all this variability. Um, so highly variable parental profiles. Nonetheless, in spite of this huge variability, I can say, based on my extensive reading of literature, my extensive um, research experience, that most parents with a migration background who have moved away from a particular language of origin, they expect their children to speak their language of origin. In addition, they also want children to be fluent in the societal language. So you've got these two things going on at once. Yet, um, as I've reviewed a lot, many, many, and I've done research into that also, many parents with a migration background, as so many of you also know, they have children who only speak the societal language and who do not speak the parents' language of origin. And you see a few um, sources there of mine that discuss this. Um, in fact, in a, a paper I published last year, I brought together 
all the studies uh, that I could find that surveyed children who hear at least one non-societal language at home. I'm here now talk, saying, calling it a non-societal language because it isn't always a language of origin, because uh, in some cases, um, the people who uh, are speaking a non-societal language at home, the, the adults, um, they do not have a recent migration background. So um, in any case, and, and unfortunately we do not know, you know, we can't pull out just the people with a recent migration background because we, we're lacking that information. But we can see in any case that regardless of parents' uh, migration status, there is massive intergenerational language loss going on. So I have here have um, found surveys from France, Japan, Belgium, Australia, and Canada. So spanning the globe, really, although there's not that many, but um, what we do find here is, um, as I, um, so you see there the study on the left, and then you see the country where it was carried out. Then you see the number of children. You see there Weltmann, Weltmann in uh, 1983, he did a study in the Alsace, and that was a huge, those were census data. So that's why that number can be so high. Um, and uh, there you then see in the last column, the percentage of children or the proportion who speak only the societal language. Um, and you can see it's only one third. Well, you know, the METRO study is very small. So there's only one third of children, 44% uh, um, in the Veltman study, but look at the other, um, uh, so 44 speak only the societal language. That means they do not speak the non-societal language, okay? Um, so the percentages are quite high and as a, so in fact, data from around the globe show that one in four bilingually raised children do not speak all the languages they hear, they hear at home. And of course, in those survey studies, it is mainly the language that is not generally used in public life, including at school, that is not spoken by children. So the non-societal language or the language of origin is at risk in spite of all these uh, media reports that we keep or media uh, opinions in newspapers and so forth and in social media that people keep mentioning, namely that uh, children with a migration background that they never learn the uh, school language. It is just not true. They do. It is the non-societal, the non-school language that is at risk. Yet, you know, you could say, well, okay, well, so what? Anyway, when children do not speak their parents' language, this is what happens. Many parents feel any or all of these and more of these negative feelings. They're not positive feelings. They feel guilty towards their own parents for not uh, giving their children their, the parents' language. I mean, the grandparents then in that case, yes. And also embarrassment, that's also embarrassment vis-a-vis -vis often the parents' own parents and versus themselves, embarrassment towards themselves. Um, and they feel ashamed uh, because they feel also like, a failure that they've really failed to transmit their own their own language and they don't understand why and how this has happened it can make um parents feel very depressed and ashamed and they can also be really angry at their children for not speaking their language and people are ashamed of those feelings of anger towards maybe a four-year-old you know and generally, they could also feel dissatisfied. And there are many more negative feelings that have come up in the literature that I've reviewed, which you can find in a chapter of mine on 2017. Um, and um, yeah, so these are negative feelings. I've rarely found an example of where a parent doesn't care. Sometimes they don't care. 
And I've never seen an example of where a parent is quite happy that their child does not speak their language of origin. That I've not seen. So the most positive is that parents claim not to care. But that's really a minority. There are no uh, quantitative studies about this. So as Anderson in 2002 uh, wrote, parents' sense of cultural identity appears to be under attack when their children do not speak their language of origin. And I know that there, um, you know, there have been various studies uh, in family language policy, um, which have, which confirm this. So if children, what happens? If children speak only the societal language, not a parent's language of origin, then it may in fact be impossible for children to communicate with members of their extended family and or their family friends. Communication also between parents and children may be adversely affected and that's partially, uh, partially has to do with differences in language proficiency. So if the parent does not really speak the societal language very well or does not understand it very well, if the child only speaks the societal language and speaks it better than the parent, that's going to create just problems of, of comprehension, but it's not only comprehension because I mentioned their communication, um, because um, not speaking the same language within an intimate relationship um, is uh, disfavored. It is really um, taken for granted that we accommodate, that we try it in a relationship that we cherish, that we try to be like the other person, which means also mimicking what they're doing, speaking their language, speaking the same language. And you can find in the uh, Cambridge Handbook of Bilingualism, you can find a chapter of mine on language choice generally in um, um, language choice generally in bilinguals, where that is um, more explained. And so both parents and also children, especially children as they get a little older are uh, beyond the age of 15. Um, although for adolescents, we know that this happens already, they may feel a sense of loss of identity, a sense of loss of culture and very important, a sense of loss of emotional bonding with the parent and from the parent to the child or the child to the parent. And that's really not a good thing. Uh, in life. <clears throat> so indeed living in a language context setting, so that is what happens when people move from one linguistic landscape and linguistic soundscape to another, um, it can be a negative or a less than positive experience for families with a migration background or for parents with a migration background. And harmonious bilingualism is instead what families with a migration background presumably want. And what is that? Well, it refers um, to a sense of subjective well being and satisfaction experienced by families in a language context situation. I'm using the term families here now because um, uh, my concept of harmonious bilingualism, um, yeah, refers to something that's happening within the family. So that's intergenerational and that affects the whole family, which is after all a dynamic system. So, and it's a, uh, a sense of subjective well-being in the absence of negative experiences that family members attribute to the ling linguistically diverse situation. Now, different profiles of parents with a migration background may lead to different outcomes for children's use of the language of origin. And I want to just remind you that all children eventually learn the societal language, well, all children, children who have no basic developmental issues. And of course, if they're in uh, a school situation where the societal language is used, now, my assessment of the following, so I'm going to present seven different profiles. Um, my assessment is based on inferences from my own research on parental input patterns, so how uh, parents actually speak to children in, and in what languages, and child outcomes, and on my understanding of relevant literature. 
and very prominent will be also the results of um, a big survey I did, um, which was published in 2007. And I only refer to dual parent families. We know much more about them than about single parent families. And also um, we know hardly anything about what happens in families where there's not just two parents, but also like a grandparent, a live-in grandparent. Occasionally we read about them. But so my um, focus here is on dual parent families, which is not to say that they are the most important. Um, and I focus only on language production, so on what um, people are able to say, um, because children and parents may understand languages that they do not actually speak. Uh, but I'm talking only about language produ production because usually also that's the only thing we ever hear about, although of course language comprehension is a huge part of uh, bilingual language use. So here is a first profile. Um, and this is a profile where there is no input to the child in the language of origin. And we look here at, I'm taking here the example of parent one who migrated at age five themselves when they were still very young and who is still some, somewhat proficient in the language of origin. So who learned to speak that language of origin in early childhood, but who is also fluent in the societal language and who only speaks the societal language at home. So this is a parent who's no longer, even though they're first generation migrant, who's no longer speaking at home the language of origin. And that parent is uh, in a co-parenting relationship with parent two who has no migration background and speaks only the societal language at home. And of course there's child who does not have any input in the language of origin does not speak the language of origin. This is kind of like normal. Yes, children cannot learn a language if they don't hear it. That's not very interesting. What is more interesting, I would be about parent one to find out what made them decide not to speak the language of origin at all at home. Then we have the situation which is called generally one parent, one language. And here we have an example of um, a parent, first parent who, was, who migrated at age 12, who is highly proficient in the language of origin, fluent in the societal language, and only speaks um, their language of origin with the child, and who speaks the societal language with the other parent, who has no migration background, who speaks only the societal language at home and who understands the language of origin. I said I would focus on production, but here I think in this profile, I want to highlight that parent two in this case uh, understands uh, what's going on when parent one speaks only, speaks the language of origin with the child. But lo and behold, also this child does not speak the language of origin. Yes, this does happen. And this is, this is one particular case where parents are very confused. They've followed this one parent, one language rule, which is, which is still being promoted by so many people. And it shouldn't because it does not necessarily lead to children speaking the language of origin. So um, I've, had, um, I've had mothers cry um, when they told me that their four-year-old does not speak their language. And they were, you know, parents in the situation here of parent one, even with the support of the fact that the other parent understands the language of origin, even in those settings. Profile three is one that I chose to show that their parents, uh, well, the uh, child, only speak, hears the language of origin at home. Both parents in this case uh, migrated from the same country as adolescents. Both are proficient in the same language of origin. Both are fairly fluent in the societal language and both only speak the language of origin at home. 
and their child speaks the language of origin at an age appropriate level. That's why we get here green letters because that's all green for the language of origin. And obviously the child also speaks the language and the societal language, but not at home, not with the parents. Profile four, also here we have the language, only the language of origin at home. Um, and here, uh, both parents migrated from the same country when they were already young parents of several children. So their children were already uh, learning the language of origin. And both parents are proficient in the same language of origin and as now older parents, really, they're both learning the societal language, but they only speak the language of origin at home and all their children speak the language of origin at age appropriate levels. That's also not quite surprising. Then another profile is the one where at home children are hearing both the language of origin and the societal language. And this is an example of where both parents migrated from the same country as adolescents. They are both proficient in the same language of origin. They are both fluent in the societal language and they both speak both the language of origin and the societal language at home. Also here we have their child who speaks the language of origin at an age appropriate level but who also speaks the language, the societal language at home. But I'm focusing here on the language of origin, but this child uh, does speak the language of origin at an age appropriate level, and in addition, the societal language. Profile six is basically the same as profile five. So this was profile uh, five. So both the language of origin and the societal language are being used at home. Both uh, these parents, this is an example where um, they both migrated from the same country as adolescents. They are both proficient in the same language of origin. They're both fluent in the societal language and they both speak both the language of origin and the societal language at home. But lo and behold, in this case, so it's the same profile in terms of the parents, but the child does not speak the language of origin, only speaks the societal language at home. Finally, we have here um, another profile, profile seven, where both the language of origin and the societal language are spoken at home by the parents. Here, the parents, unlike the previous two um, profiles, do not have the same background. Um, parent one migrated at age 18, is highly proficient in the language of origin, also fluent in the societal language, speaks both the language of origin and the societal language with the child, and speaks the societal language with parent two, because parent two doesn't have any migration background, does not understand the language of origin of the other parent, and speaks only the societal language at home, and this child does not speak the language of origin. So there are many additional profiles, um, but we can already distinguish some general patterns. Um, first in bright red here is that there's highly diminished support for the language of origin in families where at least one parent has a migration background when, of course, obviously, when neither parent speaks the language of origin to children, but that's trite. But this is less expected. So when both parents speak the societal language at home and one parent, in addition, speaks the language of origin, that was profile seven, right? Now, there is a diminished support that doesn't mean it's not possible, but is, it's quite rare, you know, in cases like this, in a survey that I did uh, recorded on in 2007, um, only in about 36% of cases did, um, no, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, that's right. In only about 36% of cases did children speak 
of the language of origin when it was this profile here. So with both parents speaking the societal language at home and one parent in addition the language of origin. There is diminished, so it's no longer highly diminished, but it's diminished support for the language of origin in families where at least one parent has a migration background. If both parents speak both the language of origin and the societal language at home, or if one parent speaks just the language of origin to children and the other parent just the societal language. There is good support for the language of origin and thus for children's bilingual development in families where at least one parent has a migration background. If both parents only speak the language of origin at home, it's probably, that's likely related to both parents having the same language of origin and migration background. So there's probably also addition, obviously there's additional factors, but anyway, that's where we find good support for the language of origin. And also if both parents speak the same language of origin at home and one parent in addition, the societal language. Of course, none of these conditions are absolute except the one where at least one parent needs to be speaking the language of origin to children at home. Otherwise, children cannot learn the language of origin. Uh, uh, we, children do need input in a language of origin. They do need to hear it. Children cannot learn just from nothing. Um, there are also additional reasons for children not speaking a, lang a parental language of origin that they hear at home or reasons for children not speaking it very well, because obviously there, are, there is a lot of variation there as well. It's not just speaking or not speaking, but how well do you speak it? Are you very hesitant and so forth? So the frequency with which children hear the language of origin, so how often, how many words per hour, it's at that level that it really matters the quality of child directed speech in the language of origin. That means, do I speak clearly? Am I speaking to a very young child? Am I speaking in a way that a baby really loves? Um, so also with these exaggerated intonation patterns so that the child can get a good entrance into the language. Um, am I responding to a child appropriately when they ask me a question? and so forth. There's a lot that goes under quality. Then the communicative need for active use of the language of origin is really of great importance as already um, Liz Lanza very early on and other researchers showed, um, you can socialize children into speaking the language you speak to them. And that is really important if you do not create a need for your child to respond to you in the language that you're speaking to them, it's gonna be very hard for them to actually um, speak that language. And also the opportunities for children to actually speak the language of origin, these are also very important. Practice makes perfect, not only in monolingual language acquisition, but also in dual language acquisition. So children need to be able to speak the language. So you've got to draw children out to ask them questions, not just yes, no questions. You've got to draw them out, tell me a story in the language of origin. Um, and that is something that is probably not so much on parents' mind. Also, of course, when children uh, become a little bit older, well, also earlier on, community expectations and attitudes play a huge role. Um, if your um, uh, parent-in-law is set dead set against a specific language of origin or against early bilingualism, it'll be very hard for you to continue as a parent to speak that language. Uh, and feel and have good relationship, good family relationships. So there are all these pressures. And then if in addition, the pedi pediatrician says it's bad for children to um, learn two languages from birth, that it slows them down, which is not true. Uh, that makes it even 
even worse. And that's really an attitude that that pediatrician is showing not as not based on any um, evidence. And of course, children themselves, soon they'll also build up expectations for language choice. And uh, I can just recount, and that happens already at a very early age, uh, I can still see um, the eyes of, of, of my granddaughter um, at 13 months of age. And I had only spoken Dutch to her. And then all of a sudden she saw me read something aloud on, um, on a screen in French. Her eyes were nearly popping out of her head. Whoa, and French was another language she was learning. Whoa, this woman also speaks that other language I know. So they notice this and they have built up expectations for language choice uh, of the people they know from a very early age. And we have evidence that this happens even earlier, okay? So, and then as children start going to preschool, they start to develop attitudes, which are of course uh, grounded also in the experiences they have at preschool. They're also, issues of identity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's many more reasons. Now, in conclusion, um, I just want to reiterate that different parental migration background profiles may lead to different patterns of parental language choice. And these in turn may lead to different levels of success for the intergenerational transmission of the language of origin. However, all this needs um, quantitative support. So far, we have no systematic studies of links between profiles of parents with a migration background specifically and the degree to which children speak a parent's uh, language of origin. So I'd like to see quantitative studies that look at this. It's not easy to do, but I think we really, you know, in order to really uh, have a sense of big patterns, we need them. And um, so I really think we need uh, research that recognizes and focuses also on the very different profiles of parents with a migration background. And so far I haven't seen anything about that in um, FLP really. And what they might mean for the language of origin. It also needs to systematically investigate. And this is a, a really important uh, question, I think. Why many immigrant parents choose not to speak their language of origin to children? For that, we of course need uh, more in-depth ethnographic studies. And why do we need all that? Not only because we just like to know as researchers, but what is really important is that we may inform parents with a migration background of the best ways to ensure that children will speak their language of origin if parents think that that is important. And herewith, I thank you very much for your attention. And I just want to show you um, a few uh, slides with references which may also be in the recording and a few more. And that was it. Thank you very much.